church. I hope you're doing good today. My name is Jake, and this is my beautiful, talented, very pregnant wife, Lisa. And we are the student pastors here at Mountain Movers Church, and we're excited to be able to talk to you today. Last week, if you weren't able to make it or if you were half asleep, I just want to give you a quick recap of what we talked about. Last week, we talked about the number a specific number, the number 42. And nine years ago, God told Pastor Brad that 42 was going to be a very significant year. And up until this last year, uh, Pastor Brad thought it might be the year that he passes away and he goes on to be with Jesus. But we learned that the number 42 has a very specific meaning. And we now know that the promise that God gave Pastor Brad nine years ago is being built right behind me on this pad, this very pad right behind me. Guys, the coolest thing about that is this building that we're, we're being building right now turns out to be 4,200 square feet. And Misty shared with you that she had never, that had never dawned on her until one day they're talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And then the number 42, God finally revealed it to her and, and there was that aha moment. So there's these awesome things of how God has been bringing the light, this number 42 and what it means. And the number 42 in this context means the moment of arrival. And it's God's timing for the fulfillment for this time and his promise. We're going to see it come to fruition for our very eyes. You know, I've heard story after story of, of old-time pastors saying, one day God's going to, one day God's going to, and maybe I'll be around to see it. Well, I've heard this for a long time. One day God's going to build a building, and we get to be a part of that, and we get to see it happen right here in this very moment. And God has given our pastors a mission this year. He's given them two things. He said, build a building and build people. And for me, I question a lot of times, well, how are we going to build a building that's expensive? How are we going to build people? There's a lot of them. But you know what? Through, through the leadership and the planning and through the This Is Our Time campaign, we're building a building. And through life groups and what's happening, we're building people each and every single week. And it's cool for this church to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit come in to Mountain River Church and the harvest of souls that we're going to see brought in is represented by the wheat that we're going to see here in just a few short months or maybe even weeks when we pull back this carpet and we get to see the wheat spread across this floor. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see that this year. Guess you're not excited as I am. They're actually clapping for me because I stood up. You know, one of my favorite things about Oklahoma is the Four Seasons. And if you've been around here, Four Seasons probably means nothing to you. But where I come from, we only have one season. And they're actually, in Guatemala, they say that we have, we're called the Eternal Spring. Because we have spring weather all year round. Which means it never gets over 80 and never gets below 40. It's perfect. And Guatemala doesn't just have perfect weather. It also has perfect people, as you can see. Okay? But really, we have amazing weather all year round, but when I came here, I didn't even know what, like, seasons were. I'm like, like, a seasoning for your food? They're like, no, like, the climate changes? I'm like, huh, what? It, it changes? Yes, it changes, and I was so amazed by it, and I love Oklahoma weather, and even though it's a little crazy, and we get summer right after winter, and winter, then go back summer, and then spring, and then summer, and then fall, and then we were confused, it still happens, right? And the one thing we can count on is the geese, that they all fly south, seeking warmer weather when it starts getting cooler. So today I'm going to ask you to participate. I know, right? How dare me? You guys are like, I just want to drink my coffee and eat my donuts. Well, you can do that later. Today we're going to participate. And if you're a rebel, well, I mean, I'm glad you're here because you need Jesus, obviously. But I'm going to ask you for something super, super simple. So I just want you guys to close your eyes. That's all I want you to do. No peeking. Carrie, Jason, no peeking. All eyes are closed. All right. Now I just want you guys to envision yourselves on a fall, crisp day. The weather's perfect, and you're sitting outside with your drink of choice, hot chocolate for those who like it, sweet, tea, coffee, and you hear these. And then you start envisioning all the geese just flying over the top of your head. And before you know it, they're gone. Okay, open your eyes back up. I'm a very visual person, so I have to see things. And when I do that, I always realize that one side of my goose formation is longer than the other. There's always more geese on the right or the left. And I was wondering, okay, why? Why, why is there more geese on the right? Okay, I need to know. I need to know I might die. And so I asked one of our hunters earlier this morning. He's like the goose whisperer. And I said, Remington, I got to know. 
why is there more geese on one side? Always. He's like, looks at me in disgust. Like, you're an idiot. You don't know why there's more geese on that side? I'm like, no, I don't. And he just said, okay, I'll tell you. I'm like, thank you. He says, it's just because there's more geese on that side. So he did a really good job making me feel super stupid. So thanks, Remy. But honestly, why am I telling you about geese? They're fascinating, and they're very, very smart creatures. They actually travel faster and further when they travel, a, when they travel together. They go 70% further than they would if they were by themselves. So they do this V-shaped formation, and the bird behind the bird gets a little bit higher to make sure that he doesn't have as much wind resistance as the bird in front of him, which causes them to not get as tired, and then they rotate. So they never grow weary because they're always helping each other fly. One of the other fascinating things about geese is that when one goose gets hurt, he'll drop down. But two geese will always drop down with him because they know that if that one little guy drops down, he's never catching back up. So they go down with him because they know that once he gets his strength, They'll fly back up, they'll do that V-shaped formation, and they will get back to the flock. Side note, that is why life, tr- life groups are so important to us here at MMC, because sometimes we're that goose that's tired, that's weary, that's hurt, that can't fly any longer, and you always have those geese that travel down with you and say, hey, I'll hang out with you right here. I'll hang out with you. I'll stay right here. I'll wait for you to gather your strength and get back up to the flock. So if you're not in a life group yet, make sure that you join us. We pick up back in the fall. But life groups are amazing, and we can do so much more together. Like geese, we can be more efficient. Yeah, well, we can't accomplish um, alone. We can always accomplish together, kind of like the geese traveling south. I want to talk two different aspects of unity and what it looks like in the the Bible, and we're going to kind of break this apart. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, we're going to talk about the selfish, the manly desire or womanly desire um, on when we pursue things for ourselves. And It says, look, he said, this is God speaking, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So a little recap of what's happening here is the people have came together and they've started talking. And and if you ever notice, like teenage boys, when they get together, they come up with some crazy, stupid idea of something to do and something gets torn up. Well, all these people came together and they said, hey, let's build this massive tower so we can be equal to God. So all these people are coming together and they start building this tower. And as the tower gets bigger, God looks down at them and he says, they're of one heart, they're of one mind, nothing thing they do will be impossible. So they were coming together and they were in unity. Yes, they were, but it was for the wrong purposes, for the wrong reason. And because of that, God scattered them all over the world. And so that's where they're at today. That's kind of how we got spread out all over the place. What else can we know? So then we can look at Acts 4.32, and this shows us more of a godly perspective of what unity looks like. And it says, now the multitudes of those who believed were of one heart. Can you say one heart? heart. And one soul. One soul. Neither did anyone say one of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So these people are experiencing a profound spiritual unity. They don't really even realize it or understand it. But they're to the point where, like, this is not my coffee. This is all of our coffees, which is kind of nasty. You guys better not be drinking after me. But really, the unity that they were experiencing was unreal. They were all in one heart. In the, uh, in the original Greek, The phrase one soul actually means to breathe or to breathe together. So I want us all to take one big breath together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three. Now, I didn't just do that because I'm out of breath and pregnant and big. I did that because I wanted you guys to see what it was like to really be of one breath all united, all in sync. And I want to show you what it looks like when one person starts a movement.
So it started with just one guy. One guy playing the trumpet and people walking around him like, you're weird, what are you doing? And then little by little, like the attitude of the people watching changes when they start realizing like, wait, this is like a whole movement and there's more people all playing different parts, all doing different instruments. And now it's creating this symphony that we absolutely love and now we're amazed, right? So what could happen, I just wonder, I think MMC is making such an impact as it is in our community and in the world. But what would happen if we all joined, kind of like they did, in a big symphony all together and we all did our our parts, we all played our instrument that God has given us, our gifts, our talents, our financial resources. What would happen if we actually all used it? Here's a really quick example. What would happen if all of us actually took our invite cards? I know you don't because we have a group of a re- we have a reset team and they're all little kids. They're not little. They're actually really amazing kids who reset the sanctuary before you guys come in. But they're always digging into those pockets behind your seats, trying to find the invite cards that you stuck in there like nobody saw you. OK, we know. We know. But really, what would happen if you took your invite card today? What would happen if you took both of them and gave it to somebody that you know? Now, we go Facebook Live every Sunday, and every Sunday we average about 1,000 to 2,000 views at the end of the week, which honestly is a lot to think about. But two weeks ago, we had our kids' pastors. They preached a message, and it was incredible. And I'm not saying this because I like them, but they kind of went viral. (laughs) Seriously, they had 5,000 views. 5,000 views. It may just be a number to you, but really 5,000 views means that there was 5,000 people who were impacted by the word of God because somebody shared it. There is 97 shares. So what would happen if today you grabbed your phone and shared the message? And first service did the same thing. And second service did the same thing. And fourth service did the same thing. We would have a lot more than 97 shares, which means we would impact a lot more than 5,000 people. What would happen if we actually united and did more than just came and sat here together, but put our gifts and our talents and our resources all for one work? Last week, our pastors, they closed off part one of the story of Nehemiah and the mission to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And this morning, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into it. And one thing I learned when I, was, when I was studying this and preparing is that I learned that Ezra, the three books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, is kind of like a three-part story. And a little funny story on Lisa, I was sitting there telling us when it happened, and I was like, oh, it's a three-part story. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's like a trilogy. I just want to say that they're not laughing because they don't know how to say it either. Yeah. I'm like, what? She goes, a trilogy. And I was like, I know English isn't your first language, but I said, do you mean a trilogy? And she's like, yeah, that's why I said a trilogy. <laughs> I'm like, hey, if she makes a mistake, she owns it and she goes with it. I was a little, I just uh, off like, just a little <clears throat> bit. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing, trilogy. So. <laughs> February, f- trilogy is all the same. Mm-hmm. She also goes to Walmarts. <laughs> yeah, everybody puts that. If you're from McDonald County or Delaware County, it's Walmarts, yeah, that's not right. Not Walmart, it's Walmarts, because they're plural. Anyways, God brought his chosen people out of slavery. You know, the people that laughed hard at that are from Matt County or Delaware County, all right? So you understand, we know. Anyways, they were in, that was free. The years of repeated, (laughs) God, focus here. God brought his people. Okay, Pastor Brad, calm down. God brought his people out of slavery, and after years of repeated warnings, God said, you know what? If you don't straighten up, I'm going to scatter you again because they're being selfish like at the Tower of Babel. So God scattered them back out, and one man started praying for him, and God softened the heart, and he allowed them to return back to their, their native lands of Jerusalem, and Ezra... He goes ahead of time to start building back Solomon's temple because he wanted a place to worship. They wanted to build the church back. But as he's doing that, he realized that there's no point in me rebuilding Solomon's temple if the walls of Jerusalem aren't rebuilt. So he sent word back, and this is where Nehemiah comes into play. He sent word back, and when Nehemiah heard the word that the walls of Jerusalem were in dismay, he was heavily burdened, and it hit him hard, like it hit him in the chest, and he realized somebody has to do something about it. Now, Jake's translation is that, Hey, God wants me to do something, but somebody else will do it. No, Nehemiah was so heavily burdened with this that it says that he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And it's believed that this went on for four months. Guys, if I have a problem, I'll complain about it. I might pray about it, and then I forget about it. I've never been heavily burdened 
And maybe I will one day, and maybe I won't be. I don't know what God's plan is. But I've never been so heavily burdened that for four months I wept about it, I prayed about it, I cried about it, I fasted about it. That's never happened to me, okay? But in Nehemiah, that happened to him. Ezra had a problem. And here's the thing about Ezra. I want to point this little fact out. It says, he set his heart to studying the law of the land, or the law of the Lord, and to practice it and to teach it. So Ezra, my translation, Ezra was a pastor. So the pastor sent word back to his people, hey, here's my problem. What are we going to do about it? And Nehemiah said, I have a solution. Here's what we're going to do about it. So Nehemiah brought everyone together. He said, you see the trouble. This is Nehemiah chapter 2, 17 and 18. He said, you see the trouble we are in in Jerusalem. We... Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began to do this good work. What's cool is this says that God put the gracious hand in front of the king. The king gave him papers. He gave him wood. He gave him everything he needed to rebuild this wall. And as a former coach, I recognize what's happening right away. As a former life group leader here, I recognize what's happening, uh, what's going on. As, as a member of the serve team, I see what's happening. Nehemiah was gathering up his serve team. He was gathering up some people to go with him. And then he gave a quick little serve team huddle like we do each and every Sunday before we go out and we greet people and we open doors and we serve coffee. coffee. And as a coach, I did this each and every week before we took the field to play a game. We bring them in. We try and get on one mindset. We, get, we have tasks. We get a vision. We try and get them amped up to get ready to go out there and do what only they can do. One time I had a player who thought he was the best of the best. Like he did not step onto the field before a game without his chest, chest puffed out. And he did the old Conor McGregor walk out there onto the field because he was just ready to take on everybody that was in front of him. I mean, I can do it again like Gavin, he sent me a video of how to do it, and I got it down pretty good. So I can just swagger around like this all day long. So he'd walk out onto the field, and he was ready to play. And one game, I was just done with it. The next day, I said, I'm going to fix this. It's never going to happen again. So we're practicing. It's going good. And I blow the whistle to end early, and they knew it because I never ended early. So we brought him in. I said, we're going to finish. We're going to scrimmage a little bit. Of course, every kid that's on a team knows that's the best thing to do to finish a practice is to finish with a scrimmage. So we divide them up. They think they know the teams. They don't know the teams because I never know the teams. But we put 11 on one side. In soccer, it's 11 versus 11. So I put 11 on one side, and I put this one kid on the other team. So it's 1 versus 11. I blow the whistle to start. Of course, they're mumbling, complaining. And I said, just play. So he takes off trying to dribble everybody. Can't do it. They take the ball. They go down and score. Blow the whistle again. This happens four or five times. And finally, the 11 kids are complaining and griping. He finally understands the point I'm trying to make. So I bring everybody in, and they realize it doesn't matter how good you are if you're all alone. It doesn't matter how talented you are if you're doing it for yourself. But once we are a team and we're a unit, we're joined together, those 11 people can move and flow, and it's like the ocean, the ebb and flow, and it's just one fluid motion as a team as they're going. And here's the thing, Mountain Movers Church is heading into the biggest task, the biggest project God has ever laid on us. And our pastors, they fasted, they prayed, and I know they've wept over this just like Nehemiah, and they're ready to do this. But just like Nehemiah, they can't do it alone. But the burden is lighter when we all participate. Did you get that? The burden is lighter when we all participate and we put in a hand. These walls that Nehemiah was building were believed to be 39 feet high, 8 feet wide, and 3 miles long. I built a lot of barbed wire fence, and it it takes a while to build a mile of fence, five strand going down there. But this was three miles long, 39 feet high, and eight feet wide, and it was impossible. I won't say it was impossible, but it was really highly unlikely that one man was going to get this built. And here's the cool thing about this. They banded together, and they got this finished in 52 days. And here's how they did that. Because just like here when we did our MMK camp, there was people who gave up their time, their energy, their resources, and they came in on this campus. Seventy volunteers made Camp Wanted possible because they gave up their time and their talent and made it happen. Events like Freedom Fest are only possible because you guys sitting in these seats give up your time, energy, and effort to come out here so people can have life change and experience something at a fireworks show and a country concert, and they get to receive Jesus. Come on. That's awesome. Yeah. Here is something I want you guys to think about. Research after research shows that 90% of the work that has to be done in in the church is only done by 10% of the people. So let me say that again. 90% of everything that needs to happen to make a Sunday 
experience possible is only done by 10% of the church. And here's some more shocking news. God has called us to give him our tenth or our tithe. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means every time you get a paycheck, you'll give him 10% of your check. Not after you pay your bills and after you buy your Starbucks and after you buy some new shoes, but before, before you do all that, to show him that you're faithful, to show him that you trust him and you believe in him, right? Well, only 10% of the church actually gives 10% back to the church, which is absolutely crazy because if if we worked the way God designed us to work, the church would have no debt. We would have no fundraisings. We would have no financial strain because if we all just did our part, if we all just did 10%, then we would be so much further along. We're talking about parts, and I want you to know that all parts are equally as important and significant. Nehemiah chapter 3 goes into talking about the gates and how they went about building each section of the wall. And it wasn't like there was a crew that was a gate crew that they went around and they were specialized in building gates. No, it says Nehemiah assigned them an area of the fence that was in front of them. And I think this happened because if I'm building a fence or a wall in front of my personal house, my property, I'm going to put a lot more pride, I'm going to put a lot more energy, I'm going to put a lot more effort into building my section of the wall because I want it to be 100% and I want it to be protected. I used to joke in college, like, I was a math teacher, so I could get by on extra credit, but I didn't want the nurses that were going through nursing school to be my nurse that just got through on extra credit because, I mean... (laughs) Think about that. Like, I can fake it till I make it in the math classroom, but if you're a nurse, you're not going to fake it until you make it, until there's a class action lawsuit up against you. But all parts of this wall were as equally insignificant and as important. And we, when we talk about the serve team, I got to do a little exit interview with someone who was quitting this, the serve team, and I said, hey, why are you quitting? And they said, because all I do is open a door and smile at people. And I said, you know what? That hurt, that breaks my heart that you say that. And they said, why? I was like, because what you don't know is on a Sunday morning when there's a single mom with three kids or a single dad with a bunch of kids coming in, and they're just doing everything they can to make it and put it together, and everything is going crazy in their life. They've had a a terrible week. They've been fighting with their ex. All this stuff's going on. But yet they come to church, and they're trying to wrangle all these little kids running around everywhere, and they walk up to the doors, and somebody opens it, smiles, and helps usher their kids to get them back there into MMK and into the nursery. What you don't know is that single mom or that single dad, they were at the breaking point but because you opened that door and because you smiled at them and you supported them. That little, what you think is insignificant, is the biggest impact they've ever had in their life. Guys, every single part is equally as important. Don't underestimate what God can do with your serving and your obedience. The impact you make is not up to you, guys. The impact you make is determined by God. Now, God desires unity, and we see this all through the Bible. So I just want to quickly take you back to the very, very first verse in the Bible, first anything. And it's Genesis 1, 1, 2, 3. And it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless, empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and then there was light. Now, you may have heard this Bible verse before. You may have read it before. But I want you guys to pay attention to three things. There's three key players in this verse. First, we have God, who is a creator. Then we have the Holy Spirit, who's hovering the waters. And then we have the Son, who's actually speaking the world into creation. So the very first thing God ever gave us showed us that we needed unity. He didn't need the unity, but he put it in there so that we could realize that before we do anything, we have to be united. Now, we're going to jump to another example because I'm all about examples. We're going to go to John 17, 21. And this is basically Jesus' story before he dies and resurrects. And he's talking about the importance of unity. And he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So here's Jesus saying, Jesus, he's saying, I want to be one with my Father. I want my Father to be one with me. But furthermore, I want them, meaning us, I want us to all be one together. So we see unity one more time. And then we're going to go quickly to Acts, which we've already read before. Now the Christians are being persecuted. If they claim that they're a Christian, they're basically done skis. But then Luke says, hey, all of those who believe, they're all of one heart and one soul. They're all in sync. They're all in tune. They're all taking the same breath. When one suffers, they all suffer. When one rejoices, they all rejoice. And today, we want to just encourage you guys. Because you know what? As humans, we can't do anything. 
we're useless. But really, we kind of are. We can't do anything without God. And like Nehemiah, we can't do anything without each other. And so today, I want you guys to think of what your part is. What is your part as our walls are down? And I don't mean the building that we're building. The walls really aren't there right now. But I mean our spiritual walls. Because our community doesn't have any walls right now. There's people who are going to hell every day. There's people who are not making wise choices. There's people who don't know right from left. There's people who don't know that there's a real life change experience waiting for them. And it's our job to unite and to join forces to go rescue them. And I don't mean to come in here and sit down and warm your seat up. I mean to do more. To pray. Not shotgun prayer, bless the building. No, not that kind of prayer. But on your knees saying, God, I just pray that you would send the people, that you would send the finances, that you would be over our leaders, that you would help them make wise decisions because the attack is real. So pray for your leaders. Pray for this building. Fast. Anything that you want. You, I can't fast food. And it's my favorite thing ever. Thank you, Jesus. But, you, but we can fast something else. We can fast something that hurts. Because when we act together as a group, we're so much powerful. Like those geese. We can do more together. Can you say, I'm a goose. I'm a goose. MMC is my flock. I'm a goose. <laughs> okay. I, I'm talking to the marketing person that we should have shirts done that say, I'm a goose. And that's all they should say. If you will do what only you can do, imagine what we can do together. So if you can do only what you can do, imagine what we can do together. Guys, I can't stress enough how important unity is, especially in this time and this season of a church and under the leadership of our, of our pastors. Guys, getting underneath them and supporting them and lifting them up, truly lifting them up in prayer and being there for them. Guys, I'm, I'm just low man on the totem pole in a sense, guys, but I feel the strain and the stress and the pressure and the tiresomeness of this whole project. And so imagine, do what you can do, and while together we can stand and do amazing things for God. If you're real quick, if you would, close your eyes and bow your head. And we do this in Accelerate. We call this a call to action. And I'm closing your eyes because we're adults and we embarrass way easier than teenagers do. So I'm, close, I'm bowing your heads and closing your eyes because I'm going to challenge you here for just a second. What is the Nehemiah situation in your heart? What is God calling you to do? What, when we're talking today and preaching on unity and talking about it, what is the Holy Spirit just dropped into your lap and said, you know what, Jake, you can be doing this. Or Lisa, you can be doing this. Or Marty, you can be doing this. What is God putting into your heart? What's he dropping you? And if, if, if I can be as bold to ask you this, if God has placed something on your heart today, while we've been preaching, there's something that you can stand for. I just want you to slip your hand up while the heads are bowed and eyes are closed because I want you to raise your hand so one, I can be praying for you, but two, you're raising your hand to God saying, God, this is me physically saying, you put a burden on my heart, amen. You put a burden on my heart and I'm ready to stand for it. Guys, I see hands all over the room. You don't know how amazing it is. I'm glad your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, but it's amazing for me to get to see these hands going up all the room. Guys, I'm gonna pray for you that have raised your hands because you raise your hand, you acknowledge it, Satan's coming. He's going to attack and be ready for it. But real quick before we pray and close, there's another group of people that I want to invite for unity today. You're sitting in this room and if you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, but right now you don't know what's going on, but you know there's something stirring and your body might be hot, but God is working on you. And you say, you know what? It's time that I surrender my life to Jesus and I want to be united with him today. So that's you. I just want you to slip your hand up because that way we can acknowledge and we can be praying for you that says, God, it's time for me to unite with you and to give my life to you. Amen. 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 Guys, if you would, raise your voices with me as we say this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father thank, you your son, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. God, I can't forgive myself, God, I can't forgive myself. But, you can forgive me. but you can forgive me. Lord, thank you for cleansing me. Lord, thank you for cleansing me. Help me to make me one with you. Help me. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if that was you today and you gave your life to Christ, we are so proud of you. We are so happy for you. We do have a gift for you, so make sure you grab one of those as you exit by the double doors. You can also text Life Change to five 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 eight eight eight. I was about to give our our giving. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us today. 
We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.